Welcome. My name is, my name is Mark, uh, one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad that you are here today. And if you saw the baptisms, we were not trying to, you know, pe- get people like this or anything like that. We want to make sure that this is something that's important. So if you have come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do it next time. That would be awesome. That's so cool. So today, here's what we're going to talk about. Oh, boy, I hate, wish, I hate this, but I have to talk about it. Today we're going to talk about this. Uh, why does God allow bad in the world? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, just think about that. Why does God allow bad in the world? I mean, it would be so much better if there was no more sin and struggles and wars or anything like that. But Jesus tells us, just before he goes to the, to the cross, he says this, in this world, you, what's the next word? Will. Will. You will have trouble. I don't like that verse. I, I want it to be, yeah, like, like, there's no more trouble anywhere else. It's all gone. That's what, I, that's what I'm thinking. But Jesus is saying, in this world, you will have trouble. And boy, do we ever. Just think about this. You know, it seems like, like every month, there's a shooting in a school somewhere in the country. And you're going, God, what, what's going on with that? I mean, come on, you know? Or then, you know, some men and women have to go to war. And, and someone has a baby, and it comes out, and it has all sorts of birth defects and struggles. And we could just keep talking all, all the rest of the time about all the bad things that happen in this world and stuff, but here we need to stop. And here's the question that I want to ask God, and here it is. If God is so good, how come there is so much bad in the world? If God is so good, how come there's so much bad in the world? You ever think about that? That's just a tough thing when you look at this. It's just hard. So I'm going to talk to you about a few things about things uh, as I was working about this. Because on, on this week, I thought, God, why? Why? Why is this world just so hard? And there's sin and there's murder and there's all this stuff. God, why? You're so glorious. Why can't you take care of all of this? And I started to put this message together. And as I was doing that, man, I tell you, I, I realized there's a lot of different things. So let me just kind of walk through some of the things that I have been looking at. First one is this. Some of the harsh things in the world is because God is simply enforcing justice. That is what God is doing. God is enforcing justice, kind of like a police officer. Let me ask you a question. When you're driving and you look in your rearview mirror and you see a police officer in his car behind you, what do you feel like? Do you feel like, oh, I feel so cozy and I'm so, I just, love, or I'm like, oh my goodness, and how much am I driving? I <laughs> mean, right? Right? How many, let's be honest, how many of you are scared? Scared when you see a cop right behind you. Yeah, the rest of you lie. That's fine. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> uh, my wife, when we're driving, when I'm driving in the car and she's in the car, she's always saying, slow down, slow down, slow down. The, co- the, the police will get you or something like that. And, and I said, no. No, I will never get, I'll never get caught, never get caught, right, like that. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> I, I, I did this backward. Um, I first should have asked, is anybody here a cop? <laughs> there okay, my name is Adam. And <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. But that is God is what God is enforcing justice. That is what He is doing. And let's be honest. I, I mean, to be to be honest, when I am driving and I see a police officer, I do look and see, oh, am I am I doing the right, the right speed or not? 
and that's just what I, that's just what I do. It's, it's really not the police officer that's making me worry. It's myself because I'm not doing maybe the wrong thing. So do you ever feel that way too? I think pretty much all of us feel that way. But this is what God does. God is just enforcing justice, just like the police do. And, and we need the police because if we didn't have the police, it would just be even worse chaos. And here's the second thing. As I was talking about to, with God and saying, God, why? Why is this world just such a mess and so horrible and all this stuff? And the second thing I came, up, came, up, come up, came out with was uh, our choices have consequences. Let me give you a verse. Galatians 6, 7 says this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. In other words, uh, what we plant, we grow. What you plant, you grow. And we're, us we're usually the, co cause of our, the cause of our own problems. I know I am, and probably you are too. We create our own problems. We can't blame it on God. We have to blame it on ourselves. Just like what I was talking about with going too fast with the police officer behind me. That's not the police fault. That's my fault. That's your fault. We have to understand. We have to take the ownership that we plant what we grow. That is what we do. And let me give you another one. God just spoke a lot this week to me. God is not the creator. God is not the creator of evil and suffering. Can I tell you, some people think that he is. But God is not God is not the creator of evil and suffering. Not at all. And you're going, well, Mark, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? Well, Genesis 1 tells us. Jesus, or God created the world. And when he created the world, he said, it was good. It is good. That's what he's saying. It's, it's good. So where did evil come from? So where did evil come from? The Bible says when God created man and women and, and created them with a free will so they could express love to him and to other people. That's what God wants. God wants you and I to love him. And what the scripture tells us is that God is our heavenly father. And we are his kids. And he wants you to come and be in one of his kids. He wants that to be there. That is God's heart. There's many people right now in this, this venue, in the other venue, online, right now. And many of you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But can I tell you, some of you online and those in the venues... Maybe you're new to church and you do not have a relationship to God. God's heart, listen, God's heart is that you would come into a relationship with God. Not just saying, yeah, I believe in God. I mean, the devil believes in God. He's not going to heaven. You need to have a relationship with God. He wants to be your heavenly father. And we're his children. This is God's heart. He's, he's wanting everyone to come into a relationship with him. But here we are on this planet, and we do things good, and we do things evil. Every one of us here do that. This is what we do. Let me, let me just th think about your hands. Think about your hands. Your hands can be good. Your hands can be good to maybe hold a child or to take some food to somebody that's hungry with your hands or maybe, you know, make something, maybe a cake for somebody or make a, a, a chair or something. Those are good things. But guess what? Guess what? Your hands can also do be, do be bad. Things like, 
taking something that's not yours, hitting somebody. Using your fingers. I'm not going to do the right and the wrong, but you know, when you're driving with people, I'll just use this one, okay? See, we can do good with our hands and we can do bad with our hands. And God's going, hmm, come into a relationship with me. So let me, let me talk to you about some other things. So things that I was looking about this week is this, is that, is that man-made evil, man-made evil were, do we, let's see, man, let's see, man-made evil, and I, we made them so bad that what happens, I'm going to tell you, out of about 80, out of 100%, probably 80%, we hurt our, each other. I was thinking, let me tell you a story. Oh, I hate this story. When I was, um, oh, I was probably about sixth, sixth grade, I ride the bus. And there was another kid named Mike. And he was very poor. He did not have very good clothes. Uh, he was, oh, he had, I don't know how to say it, but large teeth sticking out. And uh, kids on the bus would just make fun of him and they would go back there, and they would spit on him, and all this kind of stuff. And I was at the same age, and I wanted to go back there and help him and say, knock it off and stuff. But I was scared because I was a little kid too myself. And so I never did. And you know what? I'll tell you, for the last, I want to say eight years, nine years maybe, I've been trying to find him, and I can't find him. But I know his name, I know his last name and everything, but I can't find him anywhere online because I just want to say, Mike, man, I am so sorry. Because I didn't help you, that means I contributed to, to the other stuff. I, was, I didn't help. That is something that I live with, and I hate that. And if I could go back in time, I would. But that is what we do. We hurt other people. We hurt our family members, neighbors, co-workers. We do this all the time at different, time, at different things. And then there's also natural evil. Not stuff that we actually created, but it's earthquakes, it's tornadoes, it's disease, things like that. Those are things that happen because we're not in relationship with God, because we sinned. And it changed everything. It even changed natural stuff. That isn't God's heart. God, when he created the world, God said, it is good. It is good. And somewhere, somewhere along the line, it changed. It changed. How did it change? It changed this way. God in Genesis 1 says, created everything, says it is good. And then he made us. <laughs> and we made a mess of it. And you're going, well, no, 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 Mark, 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 no, no, uh -uh, no. Adam and Eve did that. Well, what do you mean? Well, well, because when, when God came and he said, he goes, hey, hey, you guys, you can do whatever you want, just don't eat from that fruit of the tree, right? And as I always, when we talk about this, I always do this. God got in his car and he's driving off and all of a sudden, Adam and Eve are going right to that tree and eat the one tree that he said not to do. And their sin starts. And you and I, listen, you and I, we can look and say, hey, well, that was this Adam and Eve. That's, 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 they did it. But we can stop and say, well, if it was Adam and somebody else, or Mark and Eve, we would be in the same boat. That is what happened. God knew 
Listen, God knew what was going to happen, and yet he allowed it to happen anyway. That is what he did, because he wants a relationship with you and with me. And can I be honest with you? I don't understand why he wants a relationship with me or any of you, any of you guys. We have messed up so much stuff. We have sinned so much. Honestly, what he should be doing is just sending all of us straight to hell. But he says no. I want to save some. I want you to come into a relationship with me. Because I'm your heavenly father. And I want you to be my child. What kind of God is that? We do these things bad and we hurt people and we do stuff and we lie. And, and he still wants us to come into relationship with him. It's just a crazy God that we have. And I'm so thankful that he wants us. I'm so glad he wants us. This is the God that loves us. All of us, even if you're not in a relationship with him, because he's still coming to you, saying, come to me, come to me. Because God wants you to come into a relationship with him. Hmm. I just think about this, and I'm like, wow. God, why? Why did you create the world perfect? After we messed it all up and it's just a mess, God, why? Why do you want us to be your, your kids? And just think about that. Let me ask you, how many of you have kids? Will you raise your hands? Okay. Okay, good. Before you had any kids, did you know, did you know that your kids are going to be perfect? How many of you knew that your kids are going to be perfect? <laughs> there, I saw two hands and they're both liars so that's okay <laughs> but here's the thing we knew before we had our kids that they would have problems right they'll have struggles they will do bad things they will lie they all these kind of things right that's what i did when i was a kid that's what you did when you're a kid that's what happens to everybody else right yep and yet here's god the heavenly father and here is god he knew he knew that yes he made the world perfect and then People came along, and it just ruined everything else. God knew that. He knew it was going to happen. God knows everything before it happens. And yet God still created the world. And he knew that we were all going to make a mess and ruin everything. But he still wanted to have his kids, just like you did. Those of you, you knew you had kids. And when your kids come out, you knew that they're going to do bad things and do stupid things and everything like that. But you still had kids. That's what God did. He knew that you're going to miss up the world that he created. But he still loves you. And he still wants a relationship with you. What kind of God is this. Just crazy story. Just amazing. And then, here's another thought. Through suffering, though suffering isn't good, God can use it to accomplish good. So I'm going to show four, four different things about this. One of them is this, is that God can use pain to draw people to himself. C.S. Lewis says this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience. But he shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. 
There's a lady named, uh, named Joni Tata, and 50 years ago, when she was a teenager, uh, she was at a pool, and she died in the pool, and it broke her legs, and she can't, haven't been able to walk for, for 50 years. And here, and here what she says. She's now in her 60s somewhere. And here's what she says. She says, I'd rather be in the wheelchair knowing God than on my feet without him. Just think about that. 50 years, never been able to walk. And she says, I'd rather be in the wheelchair knowing God than on my feet without him. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's what God does. Let me give you something else. God can use trials to sharpen our character and make us more like Jesus. That is what God wants us to do. Let me give you a verse. Uh, Hebrews 5, 8 says this. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned from the things he suffered. And I thought, man, I, I must have overlooked looked that verse before. Because that was just amazing. Well, let me say it again. Uh, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned from the things he suffered. If it worked for Jesus, it'll work for us. No pain, no gain. Let me give you another thought. God uses trials to discipline his children to reach and teach them the right path. That is what we are to do. We are to, to help our children, discipline our children. Whew. Let me just ask you a question. When you were a kid, did you do something bad? How many? Okay, okay. When you got, when you got caught by your mom or dad, what did they do? Let me just, probably some things. They probably, they probably maybe, you know, put you over their knee and whacked you or something like that. Or maybe they would put you like in your bedroom for a while and knock it off and all that kind of stuff. Or maybe not have dinner or something, you know, whatever, right? So, something like that, right? I remember a couple times when I was a kid. Um, I don't know what I did because I thought I was perfect, but that's fine. Uh, but, but, but a couple times my, my dad would take me and put me into, in, to my bedroom and said, you stay here and I'll tell you when you can get out. And that happened a couple times. Um, and what's interesting is uh, then when my daughter was born and she was younger, uh, I did that to her for a couple times and she didn't like that. And so she learned not to do that anymore. And so we just kind of learned from these things. But this is, what God, this is what God's doing. I mean, it's just crazy. God is making sure that we that we as the parents are helping the child. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And I'm going to tell you, I don't want ever, <laughs> I mean, my, pat, my dad is gone now, but, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I was just thinking, boy, it'd be weird in my age to be put in my be bedroom by my dad. <laughs> just crazy, just crazy. God, God can use trials to bring good. Did you know that? Let me, let me tell, you, tell you a story. It's in the Old Testament. It's, it's Joseph. Joseph was a boy, and this family was just weird. This, they're just weird. The dad, uh, the dad had all these boys, but um, he really liked um, Joseph the most. And so the, all the brothers are like, what the heck? I mean, cram on. I mean, why does dad like him better than, than us and our stuff? And so basically, the, the older brothers started, started saying, let's, let's kill him. And then one of them was pretty smart. And one said, no, no, let's not let's kill him. Uh, let's, let's just get some money from him and, and, and put him in slavery. And so they said, hey, that's a great idea. And so that's what happened. And 30 years later, 30 years later, Joseph, Joseph was the prime minister of the entire nation. And there was, a, there was hardly any food at that time. And they didn't know what to do. And so here is Joseph. He's in charge now. And he's in charge in this. And he's trying to figure out how to get food to people. And, he, and he's doing this distribution stuff. And all of a sudden, one day, his brothers come walking in. 
And they don't realize that it's his, the brother. Didn't know his brother. Because, you know, it's been 30 years. Everybody looks kind of a little different. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Joseph goes, Hey, guys, it's me, your brother. Do you think he was, they were happy? They're going, oh, crap. <laughs> right? That's exactly right. He's going to kill us. He's going to kill us. But he didn't do that. I mean, just think about that. I mean, just a crazy story. But Joseph said this, and Joseph says this, as far as I'm concerned, God turned into good what you meant for evil. I brought me to the high position I have today so I could save the lives of many people. Whew. Wow. He could have taken his, his brothers down and killed, but he didn't. Just think about that. That's just crazy. I had a brother. I have a brother. He broke my finger, and I broke his kneecap. That tells you how we worked. So, I love this one. The day is coming when suffering will cease and evil will be judged. Oh, Lord, bring it quick. Bring it quick, Lord. If God, if God has the power to end all suffering and evil, why doesn't he just do it? You know why? You know why? Because you and me. Because of us. That is what he does. He's waiting. He is waiting for us to come into a relationship with him. Let me give you this verse. It says in 2 Peter, it says, The Lord isn't really being slow about his return, as some people think. No, no. He is being patient for your and my sake. He does not want anyone to perish. So he is giving more time for everyone to repent. And if you don't know what repent means, it means you're going this way in sin, and then all of a sudden you turn around and you go into God. That is repent. God, I repent. I'm sorry for my sin and all the struggles I've done. God, forgive me. And God will always, God will always, God will always say yes. He will never say no. He'll say, of course. I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you for to come into a relationship with me. That's the God that loves and cares that's just amazing, just amazing. He does it for us. Hmm. Let me give you another one. Any suffering we experience in this world pales in comparison of the good God has in store for his followers. That's what God's... And I was, I, I'm running out of time, but I'm just going to tell you, there's a there's a thing that I found in the Bible. It's in, in it's, uh, Apostle Paul. It's in 2 Corinthians. You can, watch, you can read it yourself. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11. And he's talking about all the stuff that he went through. All these things where people trying to whip him and kill him and all these different things. And, and, and it, just, it just goes on and on and on. But it's too long to read right now. But then it says this. He goes, Our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long. Yet... They produce for us a great glory that will last forever. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. I mean, that's just crazy. In fact, let me, let me just kind of do it differently. Let's pretend something. Let's say it's January 1, the first, first day of the year. And all of a sudden, you have to go to the dentist because you got a broken tooth. And then as you're driving back home, you get in a car wreck. And then, and then you, you get something in the mail or email and it says that the IRS is going to take money from you. And you're going, what the heck? It's January 1. Nobody does any work on, on that time. 
And here I got all this stuff, right? But January 2 and on was just amazing. One of your friends, one of your friends um, got the lotto and got $10 million. And he says, here, I'm going to give half to you. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's just kind of crazy. The Tri-City Herald names you the person of the year. You don't have kids, but your, your wife, your wife is having, finally having, having the baby. And she says, before I have the baby, I'm going to tell you, I want you to name the baby after you. Really? Wow. I mean, just think about this. And it just keeps going on and on. Your marriage is great, and your health is wonderful, and everything was perfect. And then you come up to December 31, and you're at a party. And some guy, somebody comes up to you at the party and, and says, uh, uh, hey, how was, how was your year? And he goes, oh, man, it was awesome. It was the best year ever. And they say, well, what about that January one day thing? I mean, what happened? That? Oh, oh yeah, that was, that was a little something. But, but man, it was, it was awesome the rest of the year. It was just, just so amazing. It's just so great. That, that's amazing. That's what Jesus says heaven will be like. We in this world go through all this junk all this sin, all these problems, all these issues. But when you get to heaven and you're going, how was your life on earth? Oh, it was great. Well, what about all these other things? No. When you're in heaven, you're going to forget all about this stuff. And it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be perfect. Why? Because you're there? No, because God's there. That's what God's going to be. It's just crazy. It's just amazing, amazing, amazing. I want to close with a story. I came across this story this week, and this is a true story. <clears throat> and here's what it says. It says, during World War II, uh, Solomon uh, Rosenberg, uh, his wife and his two sons, uh, were placed in a Nazi concentration camp. Uh, Con, uh, hang on, I'm going to get it. And, 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 okay, they were in a Jews thing. Okay, okay, so okay. <laughs> it, was, it was a labor camp, and the rules were simple. As long as you did your work, uh, they, were, they were permitted to live. When you, when you became too weak to do your work, you'd be, a, you'd be killed. Hmm. Rosenberg knew that the next to go would be his youngest son, David. Because David was always been a frail child. Every evening, every evening, Rosenberg would get back into the barracks after a hard day of work and, search, and he would search for his family's face. When he found them, they would, they would hug together, they would pray, they would cry. But one day, Rosenberg got back and didn't see any of his family. He finally discovered his oldest son, Josh, huddling in a corner, weeping and praying. He said, Josh, tell me it's not true. Josh turned to his dad and said, it is true, Dad. Today, David wasn't strong enough to do his work, so they came for him. But where's your mother? Asked Rosenberg. Oh, Dad, he said, when they came for David, he was afraid, and he cried. So mom said, there is nothing to be afraid of, David. And she took his hand and went with him to their death. When Jesus died on the cross, that's what Jesus was doing for us. He did that for us. That is what he does. He is a God that takes the punishment so that we don't have to. Just amazing. And so I'm going to end with one thing. I gave you the verse at the very beginning. In this world, 
you will have trouble. That's Jesus speaking. But there's more to it now. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I, Jesus, I, the Son of God, I, the one who died on the cross, I have overcome the world. Do you believe that? He comes, overcomes the world. He is the one that has done everything for us. And all we have to do, all we have to do is come into a relationship with him. You saw some people today in the last two services getting baptized came into a relation with him. Is it your turn now? Is it your turn to come into a relationship with God? Let's pray. So Father, today... We pause right now. And I thank you that you are a good God. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you've done everything for us. You created this world. We messed it up. And Lord, I just pray. I pray that you would just help us to come into a relationship with you. Right now, I know there's many people in the venues and, and online that already have a relationship. But Father, there are people that are online or in the venues that do not have a relationship. They know about you but they don't have a relationship with you. And so, Father, we just pause right now and we pray for those that have never come into a relationship or maybe had a relationship, but they, but they walked out of it. So, Father, I just pray. I pray blessing over each person right now. Lord, will you just use us? Will you help us? Will we come into a relationship with you? God, you've done everything for us. And we say thank you because you are an awesome God. It's not about us. It's all, it's all, it's all about you. And we say thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.